Ruby was slime. I probably skip most of my talks. All right. So it's time to begin. We have a special time hour. First one hour talk by Jen. Before we talk about low bar capacity. Thanks, Ola. I, I got this water from the refrigerator. It's not six euro, right? It's not six euro, though. <laughs> 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 okay, yeah, thanks very much for the invitation. Uh, I was here a month ago uh, uh, giving some uh, lectures in the summer school about these topics and got basically to the, to the start of the talk today. So uh, it would be good to uh, have a conclusion. Uh, and I'm, I assume that everyone here is an a expert, not necessarily on what I'm talking about, but on the you know, related things. So uh, in terms of background, I'm going to go uh, a little bit quickly so we can get to the interesting stuff. So the basic idea is that we have a polytope P that we care about, say the cut polytope, the TSP polytope. Uh, and then uh, a list of this polytope P is a polytope Q in some higher number of dimensions. So here P is, say, in D dimensions, and Q is in uh, N dimensions, such that Q linearly projects to P. Right? This is a list of a list of P's. And uh, the, the idea of a lift is that if we can optimize linear functionals over Q, then we can also optimize them over P. So even if P is complicated, maybe there is a, a lift Q that's much simpler. So by optimizing over it, by proxy, we optimize over P. Okay? Uh, from the point of view of designing linear programs, this is basically saying that you can add arbitrary new variables and inequalities to your program. And then uh, what we're going to care about is the number of inequality constraints in the linear program, which corresponds to the, the number of facets in the lift Q. Okay, so the number of facets being the uh, faces of Q of highest uh, dimension. Uh, okay? And then uh, <coughs> we'll call the extension complexity of P the minimal number of facets in any list of P. So you can think about this as some complexity measure for the, the polytope itself. Um, and then as an example, sort of uh, the spanning tree polytope, for instance, uh, I mean, Edmonds uh, classified what are the facets of the spanning tree polytope. There are exponentially many, uh, but there is a lift of size order n cubed. So a lift with only order n cubed facets. So here's one example where you, I actually, I don't know if this is a correct reference, but this is a reference. Uh, some maybe somebody who knows, uh, certainly uh, such a lift appears in, in the paper of Martin. I don't know if it's the first time this was observed. Okay. so so. Uh, so this is just an example. I mean, there you do get some power from these things. And there are many, many more examples. And if you, I guess, the lectures from the summer school are online, you can go and look. We talked about uh, many more. But the main point is that this represents a fairly powerful model of computation. Uh, and it's even more powerful when you allow approximation. And uh, approximation is sort of in the, the sense you would, uh, you would think, which is that you want to have your polytope upstairs now, now instead of exactly projecting to P, maybe it's a, a relaxation, so it's, it projects to something that contains P. But then you'd like to be that if you shrink your polytope upstairs, then you, you get inside P. With the caveat that uh, you know, this, this second constraint that you're inside P, this only needs to hold in directions that you care about optimizing over. So, okay, so it's a relaxation in the sense that the projection contains P, but uh, you know, the, the approximation or the, you know, the integrality gap of your relaxation you only care about being inside, you know, you only care about being able to shrink and get inside in directions that you care about uh, optimizing over. So if you care, for instance, if you think about the cut polytope, if you care about max cut, you only care about, say, positive uh, weight functions. Okay. Uh, okay. As an indication of power of the model, I mean, okay, this is one of the dominant techniques in the design of approximation algorithms. So if you read David's book, for instance, there's literally hundreds or thousands of examples of this. Uh, and another sort of intriguing aspect of this is that uh, integrality gaps for linear programs, now there's a long history of them leading to anti-hardness of approximation results. If you can prove that sort of uh, uh, this in this model of linear programming that some problem is, uh, is difficult to solve, then this is the key often to proving that it's hard to solve in general if p is not equal to nt. So this, is a, I mean, this, this indicates that this is I mean, a non-trivial model. That for many problems, it actually captures the best thing you can do with efficient computation if p is not equal to np. And of course, on the other hand, I mean, these are not uh, like superhuman 
or they are superhuman, but a super, super computer. Okay. Uh, you know, if you cannot solve anti-hard problems unless something unexpected happens. Right? So you know, unless anti is, uh, has polynomial size circuits, you don't expect to have polynomial size when you're programming characterizations or things like the TSP polycode. Okay. So this was the general model of small linear programs. Uh, okay. Now let me give a very brief history. Many people in the audience worked on these things for a long time. I only have one slide, so the history is going to be brief and necessarily incomplete. But uh, okay, so uh, basically, some pr approaches to p versus np were attempted by uh, giving a small linear program for traveling salesmen. Uh, Yanakakis, in uh, sort of probably you know one of the most brilliant referee jobs of all time, showed that uh, uh, right uh, in response to these showed that actually. You know, sort of, uh, none of these attempts were going to work. So actually, every symmetric linear program for the traveling salesman problem uh, requires exponential size. Okay. And uh, the proposed uh, linear programs were symmetric, so this really shut down this line of attack. Okay, dot, 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 20, 25 years later. There's a lot of stuff in the meantime, but I, so I said we have only, only one slide dedicated to the history. Uh, Fiorini et al. showed that actually uh, Yanakakis' result extends to any linear program. The symmetry assumption can be dropped. So, uh, okay, exponential here means uh, two to the two to the square root of n. But uh, okay, so this was a you know a fundamental breakthrough that uh, you know sort of complete part of Yanakakis's program. Every uh, list of the TSP polytope has many many facets. Uh, one thing that's always good to do when you give a brief uh, incomplete history is put one of your own papers. So, uh, but it, but it's relevant to the <laughs> to the talk. So uh, with Suan Chen, uh, Prasad Raghavendra, and David Storr, we showed that uh, uh, no polynomial size linear program for max cut can uh, have an integrality gap better than two, okay? uh, which is interesting. I mean, when you compare it to the Goldman's Williamson SDP that can achieve significantly better with a semi-definite program. Uh, and uh, and then last year, uh, Thomas uh, Rothwell showed that. Uh, in fact, every linear program for the matching polytope has to have exponential size. Okay. So this really completed Yanakakis' program. I think this was the, the ultimate thing that uh, he would have uh, wanted to prove. Uh, and uh, right, and it's something, it's a bit odd because it's sort of you, we wanted to say that this model of computation is very powerful. On the other hand, matching has a polynomial time algorithm, even though in this model it seems to require, uh, well, exponential size, even though, of course, with, uh, you know, Using ellipsoid algorithm, you can solve it in polynomial time. Okay. Uh, so then the, the, the sort of the, the question that was op left open is what happens for semi-definite programs? Okay. And, and for various reasons, uh, the previous techniques, at least in a straightforward way, don't extend to semi-definite programs. And there are some fundamental reasons why. The one thing we knew before this work was the results of uh, Briette, Dadush, Pokhara uh, in 2014, which is that uh, you know, by a sophisticated, I mean, a non-trivial counting argument, that uh, random 0, 1 polytopes don't have small lists. Okay? So this is sort of an analog of, of Shannon's observation that uh, you know, uh, most functions don't have small circuits because there's more functions than circuits. Okay? And there, so there are more polytopes than there are lists, even semi-definite lists. Okay? Uh, so of course, you need some nice way to discretize the space of uh, semi-definite programs. And we'll come back to this soon. But this was the state of the art. Please, if you have any questions, ask. I went a bit fast so far. Okay, so what does it mean, uh, sort of, when I say here, do not admit semi-definite programs of uh, sub-exponential size? So here's here's the equivalent model for semi-definite programs. Uh, okay, so let uh, S k plus denote the cone of real k by k symmetric positive semi-definite matrices, okay. and then a spectrohedron, it's a nice name, uh, is the intersection of this cone with some affine subspace. Okay. So it takes some linear subspace translated, intersected with this cone, this gives you a spectrohedron. And those are exactly the feasible regions of semi-definite programs. Okay. Uh, here's a picture uh, due to Bernd Sturmfeld. The, the yellow thing is the elliptope, and uh, the red stuff is not part of it. Yeah. No, no, I that's what I say, but a couple times Darren has sat in the audience, and I don't think he appreciates this. It's just to make it cool comment, but, uh, but uh, it is just to make it cool. Uh, well, Baron calls it the samosa, 
And so maybe some kind of dipping sauce or something. But OK. Uh, OK, so then we can say that a polytope P admits a positive semi-definite lift of size k uh, if it's the linear projection of one of these spec phaedra. So two, e oh, okay, one easy observation here. Uh, uh, the minimal size of a PSD lift is at most the size of a minimal size of a polyhedral lift. So there's, there's the minimal dimension in which you can get a, a PSD lift is at most the minimal number of facets in a, in a polyhedral lift. This is a, not too hard to see once you write things down. So this is a more powerful model. Uh, and again, there is some indication that, that you know, semi-definite programming is a canonical model for certain classes of problems. So Assuming the new game's conjecture, there's actually a mechanical way to take integrality gaps for semi-definite programs and convert them into hardness results, into anti-hardness approximation results, assuming the new game's conjecture. Okay. Uh, okay. So this is, the, this is the model of a small uh, semi-definite program. And again, if you think about it from a design point of view, it corresponds to uh, you know, taking a vector program, adding in uh, as many new uh, variables as you want, and then uh, well, okay, in this case, actually, we're counting the number of variables. So it corresponds to counting the number of variables you add to your vector program. Uh, yeah. Good. So, uh, okay, what are our results with uh, Prasad and David? Okay, so the first one is that one, uh, one can get exponential, or depending on how you refer to this type of bound, close to exponential lower bounds on the, on the PSD list size or on the, on the small semi-definite programs that capture some classical polytopes. So PSP, the cut polytope, stable set polytope, don't admit uh, uh, semi-definite programs that are smaller than C to the N to the 211 size. Um, okay, good. Uh, and uh, maybe equally as interesting, the, the lower bounds are uh, via connection with the, the Lasserre or sum of squares hierarchy of semi-definite programs. So we'll see this connection soon. And then in terms of approximation, one can also get fairly strong bounds. So for constraint satisfaction problems, like max cut, max 2 sat, max 3 sat, and so on, uh, SDPs of polynomial size are, uh, in terms of integrality gap, equivalent to uh, the semi-definite programs that arise from uh, order one rounds of uh, sum of squares or the set relaxation for the problem. Okay. And one consequence of this, since we have strong lower bounds, uh, for sum of squares is that, for instance, no polynomial size semi-definite program for max 3 set uh, can do better than a 7 8 approximation. Okay, so this matches uh, Hastad's anti-hardness result, but sort of unconditional. And uh, then at a very high level, the way that it's going to work is that we'll start with some small semi-definite program for a problem, and then we'll, uh, we'll interact with this program to learn uh, an equivalent sum of squares semi-definite program on a subset of the variables. And then if we do this, we have strong lower bounds for, for uh, sum of squares, uh, sort of, uh, say, for, for things like max 3 set. So then immediately we'll get lower bounds also for, uh, on the size of any semi-definite program. Uh, so this is a very high level um, view of the proof. OK, so now, uh, yeah, so let's move on to the technical details. I mean, one, one thing when you first look at this model, I mean, the number of different spectrohedra you can imagine seems uh, very vast, and we already said it's a, comp it's a powerful computational model. So you would seem it would seem doubtful that you can prove anything in it in terms of lower bounds. But uh, okay, but Yanakakis already sort of gave the, the tools uh, to do this uh, in terms of uh, factorization of non-negative matrices. So if we have some non-negative matrix M, so this is a little M but a little N non-negative matrix, the rank of M, I just remind everybody the linear algebraic definition of rank. Is the minimum R so that we can write Mij as the inner product of vectors Ui and Vj that fit in R dimension. Okay. Uh, the non-negative rank is the same thing, except now we require that the vectors fit in the positive order. It looks very similar, but of course it's a vastly different kind of quantity. You know, I mean, this one is, you know, the first one is linear algebraic, the second one is very combinatorial. It's difficult, I think, to, to uh, like it's anti-hard to, to figure out if a, a matrix has non-negative rank 3 or not, and so on and so forth. So this is a much more complicated parameter. Uh, and then the positive semi-definite rank of a matrix, everything is, again, the same, except that now, uh, instead of requiring that we're in the positive orthon, we require that our vectors are, are positive semi-definite 
matrices, R by R matrices. And the inner product is the Frobenius inner product, which of course just corresponds to thinking about the matrices as uh, R squared dimensional vectors and taking the inner product. Okay, so th those are three definitions of rank. rank. What, mat what matrices do we care about? They're gonna be the slack matrices of the, the polytope. So suppose we have a polytope P, let's write it in two different ways. One is just as an intersection of closed half spaces. The other is as a convex hull of some finite number of points. Uh, and then given two such representations, we can construct a slack matrix. So it's uh, basically for every vertex of the polytope and every, and every hyperplane, this matrix records the distance from that vertex to the hyperplane. So how far inside the polytope is it? Right? All of those points are inside the, the polytope, which means that all of these values are not negative. And this measures exactly sort of how far inside they are. And then here's the beautiful theorem of, uh, of Yanakakis that was extended to the setting of positive semi-definite rank by uh, Fiorini et al. and uh, Gouveia, Perlo, and Thomas. The minimum size of a, of a lift for P, say a polyhedral lift, is precisely the non-negative rank for any slack matrix of P. And the minimum size of a spectrohedral lift for P is precisely the positive semi-definite rank of any slack matrix of P. So, so studying these factorizations is equivalent to studying this. This is a beautiful theorem, which, you know, I mean, well, the first time you see it, it's quite remarkable. When you sit down and try to prove it or understand the proof, you, you see, I mean, it's, it's a really just a LP or SCP duality. But, uh, but this is going to be the path to prove it, being able to prove that these things don't exist. Uh, okay, but I want to take a little bit of a different philosophy here. Uh, okay, it's the same philosophy, just I use different words for it. So I want to think about a polytope as basically a set of theorems. So uh, a polytope P is, of course, you can think about it as uh, a collection of valid linear inequalities. So it's all the linear inequalities that are valid for all the points inside the polytope. Uh, so I want to think about this as sort of a set of theorems about the, about the polytope. And then Farkas' lemma tells us that every valid linear inequality for the polytope can be written as a conic combination of the defining inequalities. Okay. So then I want to think about this as sort of a, you know, uh, the conic combinations are proofs of the, of the theorem about the polytope. And, uh, and then the defining inequalities are the axioms of the proof system. So, and so the proofs are non-negative combinations of the axioms. And then you can think about the lift size equivalently as just the smallest set of axioms that generate all of the value inequalities for P. Okay? So when I say generate, I mean, uh, again, the axioms are uh, sort of, the axioms are a list of inequalities and the proofs are uh, non-negative combinations of those inequalities. And, uh, but, but since we allow lists, actually we can use, we're allowed to use auxiliary variables in our, in our inequalities. Okay? So this is, I'll say something formal in a second, but this is really a characterization, again, of, of the lift size. So now for the rest of the talk, let's just focus on one polytope, the cut polytope. It actually doesn't, even if you don't quite remember what it is, it doesn't matter. First of all, the definition is there. It's the convex hall of indicators of the edge set of cuts in the complete graph. Uh, but in particular, let's, I'll, I'll tell you now all of the valid linear inequalities for the cut polytope, and then you can, you know, you can just think about it this way. Okay, so what are the valid inequalities? Let f be a function uh, sort of uh, from Rn to R that's a quadratic polynomial. Uh, so it's an n-variate quadratic polynomial such that the restriction to the discrete cube is not negative. So consider any such function. So here are some examples. Uh, f of m, and of course, it's a square, so it's not negative everywhere. Here's another example. Uh, which is more interesting because it's this, this polynomial is, uh, takes negative values on Rn, but on the discrete cube, at least when n is odd, this uh, takes only non-negative values. Right? So this will come up later, so let's just stress why this is the case. I mean, here, if n is odd, we cannot get to n over 2. We must be you know, off by a half. So then when we square a half, we get at least a fourth. So this thing is always non-negative. Okay, so that's two examples of quadratic polynomials. Uh, the claim is that, uh, uh, and this is a well-known, sort of well-known fact about the cut polytope, that uh, sort of for, for any such f, which is a quadratic polynomial whose restriction to the discrete cube is not negative, uh, this inequality is a valid linear inequality for the cut polytope. Now, of course, what does it mean? It's a quadratic inequality, so why is, how is it linear? 
Well, it's, uh, it's linear if, if you consider it to be a, you know, if you consider this f to be a, a linear function in xx transpose. Yeah, so you can, you can think about it. The entries of xx transpose are xi, xj. So here you get the quadratic terms. And then, and then every such polynomial, uh, well, every such inequality can be thought of as a, as a linear inequality in xx transpose. It's not so, this is not so important, which is why I don't, uh, uh, I'm not stressing it so much, because we only, we're only going to care about the slack matrix. So then for us, it's just we can just think about things down here. OK, so, I'll, so, okay, so here's an equivalent uh, statement of our problem. Suppose we take all of the quadratic functions that are non-negative uh, on the hypercube. So that's this uh, family QML. Um, and then, again, so, okay, so th this is sort of the statement of theorems that are in our, in our language that are true about the cut polytope. Uh, so now we want to ask, what's the smallest set of axioms we can use to prove these statements? Uh, and, and by interpreting small in two different ways, you get polyhedral lists and, and STP lists. Okay, so that, let Q be a subset of this, just functions from the discrete cube to the real. Okay, so I use this L2 of 0, 1, N. This is the Hilbert space of, of these functions, but okay. It's uh, finite dimensional, so it's just the space of all the functions on the discrete cube. So for any such subset, we can define the sum of squares cone over these uh, subset of functions as the cone of all the squares coming from Q. So you take all of the squares of things in Q, sum them up with uh, non-negative coefficients. This gives you the sum of squares cone. And the point is, this is again, this is again a, some subset of functions on the discrete Q. Uh, OK, so now the minimum size of a polyhedral lift for the cut polytope is exactly the minimum size of a set of functions such that the sum of squares cone for that set generates all of the all of the true sort of all of the true quadratic inequalities on the hypercube. Okay, so this is uh, okay. so sort of like now you just you just look for a set of functions such that the sum of squares of those functions can 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 certify that all the quadratic functions that are non-negative on the hypercube actually are. And in the in the semi-definite case, you have the same thing. I'll explain the uh, approximation sign in a second. Uh, except that now I allow you to use a subspace of functions, and what you measure is the dimension of the subspace. So here you use finitely many functions, you look at the size of the set. For semi-definite programs, you get to use a, a subspace and, and you measure the dimension of the subspace. Okay? And the, the approximation here is just that this is true up to a, up to a square. So in fact, the PSD lift size is uh, at least the square root of this number, and it's at most this number. And if you really wanted to get equality, what you should do is instead of taking your functions to be real valued, take them to have values in a Hilbert space, and then take the norm squared of, of Q in the sum of squares cone, and then you would again get equality. But for us, it's, uh, you know, we're, uh, this, this square is not going to matter so much, so I mean, suffice it just to work with this notion. Okay. So it's, uh, I mean, it, it becomes a very simple problem, just sort of, uh, well, simple to state problem. You know, uh, just you know, uh, show that no small dimensional subspace uh, of uh, of functions, when you take the sum of the squares, can generate all the quadratic inequalities. So, and then, by the way, this was all this is all well known. I just restate well known things so far. Okay, is, it, is everything clear? Everybody. The first one is equality. The second one is is a. Uh, what's that? What here? No, no, you could, I mean, your, your, your axioms could prove many other things as well. They could certify many other things. I just want to at least certify all the quadratic things. I want every, every, every quadratic uh, non-negative function, I want to be written as a sum of squares. But maybe I generate lots of other inequalities, too. OK. Uh, so, OK, so, I mean, now the natural question to ask is, you know, what are the natural families of axioms one might use? Right. You want to have a, a low-dimensional subspace which can generate uh, lots of different inequalities. And, and uh, I guess a good thing to, to note here is that sort of this space of functions is symmetric under permutation of the, the variable. So if you permute the variable, we'll just get another function in this, in this set. Uh, so, so a natural thing to do is to look at, is to look at sort of uh, sets of axioms that are symmetric. Because, I mean, you want to prove a symmetric set of things. I'm not sure how much this flies. We'll see a technical statement in a second. But uh, here's a very natural uh, family of axioms you might think about. 
So the, the family, you know, sort of the family will just be the, you know, given a parameter d, the space of all multilinear polynomials of degree at most d. So, uh, okay, so for, for some function, define the sum of squares degree of s to be the smallest d such that s can be written as a sum of squares of uh, degree at most d multilinear polynomial. That's the sum of squares degree. It's an easy observation that for any function, the sum of squares degree is at most n. Uh, in, in, the, in the case of the discrete cube. Uh, why? Just, uh, okay, so the, you, know, you have a non-negative function, take its square root, which is again a non-negative function. Now you can write its square root in the Fourier basis as a polynomial of degree n, square it back, you get a, you get a, uh, you get f as the square of a degree n polynomial. Uh, for the cut polytope, I mean, so for quadratic functions, it, it wasn't exactly clear here, but actually, I guess Monique had a conjecture that the answer is the ceiling of n over 2 for the, for the cut polytope. And this was proved recently by uh, uh, Spazi, Sanderson, and Perillo. Uh, that it, we don't need this, but uh, so, okay. So, uh, interesting question, you know, even once you have this, this upper bound. Okay, so here's one lemma that we proved uh, with uh, Prasad, David, and, and Ning Tan, and was independently uh, proved by Spazi, Sanderson, and Perillo, which is that if you have a sort of a subspace Q. And the sum of squares cone over Q is invariant under permutations of the variables. Okay, so it just means that uh, take, some, say, take something uh, which is a sum of squares of things from Q, permute the variables, you should get something else which is still a sum of squares of things from Q. And it's not too big, so the dimension is bounded by, say, n choose D. Then, in fact, uh, your cone, uh, your sum of squares cone is contained in a, a sum of squares cone for of low degree polynomials. So this is, uh, you know, so, and the, the point is, I mean, the dimension here is, it's about n to the 2d, so it's sort of you don't lose too much in the dimension. And what this says is that, okay, it's a little bit subtle. If the statement, of, if the set of statements that you can prove, uh, so the set of statements should not be q, it should be sum of squares of q, that you can prove is symmetric, then you might as well take your axiom to be low degree polynomial. Okay, so like a, uh, Right. Sum of squares of Q is all the things you, all the sort of non-negative things you can certify using sum of squares for Q. If that's a symmetric set, then you might as well take it to be, you know, up to a factor of two, just sum of squares of low degree polynomials. You might as well use those as your axioms. You'll prove even more things than you would prove with Q. What we want to prove is just a slight rewording of this. We don't want to prove, I mean, we don't want to generate as a sort of a, we don't want to prove a, a symmetric set of statements. Uh, okay, let me, it's, okay, it's a subtle thing. We do, in fact. So the set of statements we would like to prove are just the, all the quadratic, multilinear, non-negative functions. Okay? That, you know, that collection of functions that we want to certify is a symmetric set. Uh, we would like to say that uh, for such a set, we, we might as well take Q to be the span of low-degree polynomials. This would be the claimed connection between arbitrary semi-definite programs and, and sum of squares programs. I, I hope it's clear that these two things are different. You could certify everything in F using a non-symmetric uh, family of uh, 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 sort of, use, you know, you could have a, 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 a subspace Q, so that when you take all the sums of squares, you certify everything in F, also possibly many other things, and the, and the set of things you certify is not symmetric. Okay? And then, then this lemma would not apply. And, okay, this seems technical, but it's, it's a real phenomenon, okay? So sometimes having asymmetry in the axioms can, can do strictly better than not having, uh, than, ha than having something symmetric. So, in fact, strictly better in the sense that you, it can be the difference between polynomial and non-polynomial. Okay. And, by the way, the, I mean, the, I, so, for instance, uh, you know, there, there's sort of a number of versions of this argument, but the, the reason that, that this is true, that you might sort of uh, get somewhere with an asymmetric family of axioms is because it's possible that there are many different ways to certify that something is a sum of squares. Like, uh, not just a unique one when, you know, there might not be a unique representation in this cone. Uh, and then, uh, you know, you can think, for instance, uh, maybe if you just start throwing in random axioms, then when you combine them all together, you know, they start you know, proving various statements. Uh, and because there are multiple ways to write everything, you know, I don't have to sort of you know, maybe by th after I throw in enough random axioms, I'll be able to prove everything I want to prove. Okay. So this, you know, this you, you know, uh, Nishith has a, uh, a viewpoint of, of sort of 
you know, what goes on for perfect matching in this sense. Uh, and so it really can happen that you get something which is strictly smaller than any symmetric uh, set of axioms. Uh, like the, the dimension is strictly smaller than any symmetric set of axioms can prove because of this phenomenon that you know you just throw in some random things and then somehow you or get everything. Gaps yeah. Yeah. The large gaps are for symmetric x. So I mean, I mean, there's a, I mean, the largest gap. I mean, okay. There's, there's interest in like measuring the largeness of a gap is the interesting thing. Like, is the gap between you know, two to the n and two to the n over two? It's not. Is that a bigger gap than between n to the ten and n to the log n? So you can depends how you measure things. But uh, you know, but but there's a big, you know, there's a big gap here even for the uh, for perfect matching. So there is a for the for the perfect matching polytope there is a uh, the the smallest uh, th there is a smaller asymmetric uh, say polyhedralith uh, than the best symmetric polyhedralith with the con it's the constant and the exponent but it's true so I mean that's one example and that's it's clearly symmetric okay so uh, yeah mm -hmm. why is there an if This is no, there's a, no, no, here there's a, here there's a, kind of there's a quantifier that's missing, but for every Q, if the sum of squares cone of Q is invariant under permutations of the variables and the dimension is small, it's contained inside a, a sum of squares of low degree polynomials. So no matter what set of axioms you come up with, if it's invariant, if, if the set of statements you can prove is invariant, you might as just, you know, uh, it might as well just as use low degree polynomials. Okay, so here is now the, the, the way the proof is going to work. Uh, we'll fix some function g that's non negative. I mean, you should think about this function g. This is, a, this is something which is going to be hard to certify using sums of low degree squares. Okay, so we're going to take a, hard, a, a function g that's hard for low degree squares and prove that uh, sort of some related functions are, are hard for uh, any small set of axioms. So fix a function g. And now, so g is a function on m bits. For every subset of size, for every subset of 1 to n of size m, g, g of s, this is a function also on n bits, but you, uh, well, not also on n bits, this is a function on n bits, which you get by applying g only to the bits inside s. Okay, so for every subset of m things, we just, we look at the function which is g, uh, which is just uh, uh, applied to that subset <coughs> of m bits. So this generates n choose m different, different functions. Okay, so this let uh, f g n. This is the family of all such functions. So again, those functions are on n bits, but they only look at m bits of their of their input, and, and they look at the m bits inside s. And so here's the the main qualitative technical theorem. Okay, the right hand side is the interesting is the interesting part. Uh, if you start with some function g that has large sum of squares degree, so it's hard to certify with a low degree sum of squares, then if you want to certify non-negativity of all of the restrictions of G on the larger input, okay, that's what this says. If you want to look for the minimum uh, dimensional set of axioms such that the sum of squares cone over those axioms can prove everything in this family. This family is just the set of restrictions of G to all the subsets of size M. Then you get a lower bound which is growing like N to the sum of squares degree of G. So you start with a, a function G which is hard for sum of squares. And you get a family of functions that are hard for this, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, hard to certify by small semi-definite program. Okay. In particular, the hard to certify by any low-dimensional set of axioms. So, so now, if you, I mean, okay, this is almost everything you need. Now you, now you just need, uh, okay, you need some quadratic function that has a large sum of squares degree, and such a function was discovered by Grigoriev. Uh, years ago, for every, and it's the function we've already seen, this is the so-called knapsack polynomial, for every odd m, this function uh, is difficult, you know, the, the fact that this function is non-negative on the hypercube is difficult to certify unless you use uh, very high degree polynomials. So the, to certify this by writing it as a sum of squares requires degree, uh, degree at least m plus 1 over 2. So now if you combine, you know, our main theorem together with uh, Gregoria's result, you at least get the sort of kind of qualitative statement you want, that the minimal dimension of a PSD lift of the cut polytope is growing faster than 
any polynomial. And what you get it is just for every m, you come here, grab this function, which has degree at least m over 2, and then plug it into the statement. You get a family of functions, all of which are their restrictions of g. So each of them is also quadratic. So you get a family of quadratic uh, functions, such that the, the minimal dimension needed to prove them all is uh, growing like n to the m. And since you can do that for every m, you, 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 you can assert that and there's no, there's no uh, way to, to capture the cut polytope with a polynomial size. It doesn't, so the, the point here is that there's a, there's a constant here that depends on g in some arbitrary unspecified way. So if you, if you just apply this uh, as is, you can only conclude that it has to grow faster than any polynomial, but you don't, okay, maybe if you're very careful, you can get some very slightly super polynomial growth, but you definitely aren't going to get an exponential lower bound from this theorem. Okay, so to get the exponential lower bound, you have to do everything quantitatively, and it gets messy. But this is the, so this is the main idea. That you, you start with a function that's hard for sum of squares, and then you just sort of plant that function all over the place. And in some sense, you can think about it as uh, you're sort of forcing the family of axioms that's going to prove all of these things to be non-negative to, you know, you're, you're trying to encourage it to be symmetric by saying, you look, it has to work everywhere. So, you know, if you, if you preferred only some part of the space, then you wouldn't be able to prove all those axioms. Okay, and indeed, if you do that, then uh, you get a lower bound. Okay, so this is the, now we try to, to sketch the proof of this fact. Is it, is it clear what we're saying here? You start with a hard function, take all of its, you know, sort of restrictions on some, on some larger set of bits. That family is now hard to certify for any low dimensional subspace. Okay, so here's the proof outline. We need to go back to the setting of factorizations, but I'll explain the connection with uh, these sort of axioms and theorems set up. Okay, so, so the matrix, so now, okay, so now fix this, fix some function g. Okay, and you, let's assume that the sum of squares degree is large. And form this matrix, which is indexed by sets and the uh, elements of the hypercube, uh, where m s x is just the g evaluated at x restricted to the, to the variables in the set s. Okay, this is a, you know, if you think back to everything we said, this is now a submatrix of the slack matrix of the cut polytope. Okay. Uh, by the factorization theorem, if the cut polytope had a small PSD lip, the positive semi-definite rank of this matrix would be small. What does it mean? It means we could write the matrix as trace of AS BX, uh, where all of these matrices A of S for subsets of size M and all these matrices B of X for elements of the discrete cube are, are uh, R by R positive semi-definite matrices. This is what it means to have small PSD rank. And the way you should think about this in our previous language, it's not quite clear from here. You have to sort of write things down. But these are the, these are basically the proofs. So for every, in fact, actually we can, yeah. So for, for every S, you know, I might want to certify non-negativity of this. So for every S, I'll have a, some, a proof. Okay, which is sort of this matrix A of S, which uh, you know, combines with the axioms to prove the non-negativity. And these are the axioms, if you really want to get the axioms in the sense we said before, which is you really want to get a set of functions such that, uh, such that when, you, when you take this trace, you're getting the sum of squares cone. What you should do is you should take the square root of this matrix B of X. If B of X is positive semi-definite, the positive square root. And then just take the, take the functions that are the entries of that square root. So there's uh, R squared such function. What you're generating here by taking all possible A of S is, is the sum of squares cone of those functions. Okay. And if you, if, you, if you listen to what I said, there was an R squared. That's exactly the quadratic gap that came up before. Instead of R, it's R squared. But, you know, this is a okay, so what, what's the idea? We have such a factorization. This was just to connect it back to what we said before. You don't have to remember the analogy. We have a factorization like this. Now we'll just try to approximate this function b. So b is, a, is taking elements of the discrete cube to, uh, to uh, PSD matrices. We try to approximate it uh, by the square of another matrix, where this matrix r of x is a low degree polynomial. And what I mean is just that if I look at any entry ij of the matrix, then it's a low degree polynomial. This is what we'll try to do. And if we can do that, we're in good shape, because you know, this thing is just g restricted to uh, to s, and on the right-hand side, we would have 
written this as the trace of a of s times r of x squared, where now this is the square, you know, basically what, what, you, what you get over here is the square of a low degree polynomial. And this shouldn't be possible, because we assume that the sum of squares degree is of g is large. We shouldn't be able to write, we shouldn't be able to write any restriction of g as a low degree sum of squares. So you actually, you know, if, if we could really make this idea work, then you would ask, what's the point of this restriction? Okay, that's going to come up later. We, you know, but, uh, you know, this idea won't quite work. So then we're going to have, at that point, we'll have to use the fact that we actually have a restriction. But for now, if we could do this, my claim is that we would have proved what we want. If you can approximate this b by the square of the low degree thing, uh, okay, you can just, you can calculate, you can, if you write out what this is, this is the sum of squares of low degree polynomials. Okay, so you'll have written g as the sum of squares of low degree polynomials, which is, was impossible if we assume that the sum of squares degree is large. Okay. Okay, so how are we going to prove this? So first of all, this is a ridiculous thing to try to prove with knowing nothing else, because I mean, you should not be able to approximate anything by squares of low degree polynomials. So the first thing we need to do is, is uh, get some nicer analytic form of this factorization. Uh, and to do that, it, you know, we sort of, we, uh, we take this result from uh, Briette, the Duchenne Vokada, which says that we can assume that the eigenvalues of all the matrices involved here are bounded by R. Okay, so the, you know, this is a, this is sort of an, you know, kind of a real algebraic statement, but the proof eventually is going to be something analytic, so we, you know, we need to control error terms and things like that, so, okay, so we're going to, you know, all the eigenvalues are bounded by R. This is done using, I mean, uh, as, as you sort of, as one might guess, this is done using an appropriate John ellipsoid to sort of, you know, uh, transform the space so that things are in nice positions. Uh, this is essentially the only way that uh, small PSD rank comes into the proof. If I wrote this in a slightly more technical way, it would be, in fact, the only way that it comes into the proof. If, you, if I just say the eigenvalues are bounded by R, then in this statement, you still have to know that each one has at most R eigenvalues. So you have to write it a little bit differently to, to get rid of the rank altogether. But, but this is where the, the rank is used. Uh, okay, so okay. so now we know that all of these things are are not so are not so bad. So now we attempt this approximation to approximate b by a low degree sum of squares. Okay, uh, the, the slide has like an ominous uh, title: quantum learning. Okay, so here's the setup. We have a map. Uh, so you sort of you can forget from what we were talking about. Now I'm just going to look at the approximation problem. We have a map from the hypercube to k by k positive semi-definite matrices, which is normalized, so the, so this, okay, this is a uniformly random x. If I take a uniformly random x and take the trace of q of x, the expectation is 1. That's just a normalization. And we want to approximate q by some simpler map uh, q tilde. Okay, so actually, the, our simpler map is we want it to be a low degree square. Uh, and let's have the same normalization for q tilde. But if we try to do that, I mean, we were, we're going to fail. Uh, it's not possible just to take, you know, complicated maps and approximate them by simpler maps. The key is that we only want to do it with respect to a certain class of tests. So this is this family T is going to be our set of tests. Our tests look like this. They're functions from the discrete cube just to, these are just symmetric k by k real matrices, not necessarily positive semi-definite. And this is what we would like. This is the natural thing to require that sort of when I take basically the, the inner product we, of my test with Q, and the inner product of my test with Q tilde, I get outcomes that are within epsilon. This is the notion of being able to, of approximating Q uh, by Q tilde with res, you know, within epsilon with respect to the family of tests. Okay. I'm just setting this as a general kind of approximation problem. You can put in whatever tests you want. Here, of course, I enforce that the tests are linear. If you think of this is an inner product between, between two things, if you write things in the correct way. And so now the claim is that, yeah. So I, I require here that the that the the traces are the same. So the Qs are scale invariant. You're saying that the lambdas are not scale invariant. Yeah. Yes, that's true. So the 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 operator norm of lambda will come up in a second. This will make it. I mean, uh, you know. So sort of you know one way to make it scale invariant is to say that it should be at most epsilon uh, uh, divided by the maximum operator norm of any of the tests. Then you would make it scale invariant. Instead, I'll just say that the complexity of the family of tests depends on the, the operator norm of the things in this family. Uh, okay, so, so we're just addressing Michelle's point. Uh, 
So okay, so if those, uh, the claim is that if I, if, if I only use low degree tests, so again, this, these are matrix valued functions, but by the degree I just mean think about the, the entries of the matrix as polynomials and take the maximum of the degree of all of those polynomials. That's the degree of the matrix. So suppose that uh, all the tests uh, have small degree and also they all, all the tests have uh, eigenvalues bounded by omega. So the magnitude of the eigenvalues of the test is bounded by omega. Uh, okay, so now you know, my tests are nice in some sense. They, you know, th this says that they're, they're low degree, and this one, this sort of says that they don't look too closely at any piece of the space. Okay, they have to be somewhat spread out. Uh, so then the claim is that there is a, a function R taking values in positive semi-definite matrices. Uh, okay. I'll describe the middle line in a second, such that R of x squared uh, uh, is a good approximation to Q with respect to all the tests. And then we, and then you know, the, the important point here is that of course we, you know, we could take r. We, remember, q is positive semi-definite. We could just take r of x to be the square root of q, and then this would be a, we would, we would, you know, we would just have q x minus q of x here. But the point is that now we get some some bound on the degree of r. Where does the bound? What's, what, you know, where, where does the bound come from? It comes from here. So here, Michelle, you can see their scale invariance. You, uh, you divide uh, yeah, uh, omega by epsilon. Uh, yeah, so the, okay, so the, the complexity of R is, is determined by the complexity of the test, or the degree of the test, the sort of the maximum eigenvalue of the test and the amount of error you want, and this parameter here, okay, so what is this parameter? I don't really want to say what it is, but, uh, okay, I'll write it formally, but it, it's, it's not so, okay, it's not so complicated. This U of Q, this U sub Q is just, I have a function from the discrete cube to K by K matrices. So now I just think about this function as a giant block diagonal matrix. It has two to the n blocks, each one is k by k. That makes sense. That's this u, u. It's just this giant block diagonal matrix. And this is the, the, quant, the von Neumann relative entropy between, between that matrix and, uh, and sort of the, what's called the maximally mixed state, just the identity matrix scale to have trace one. Okay. So this is some measure of how close you know, this q is to, uh, uh, to sort of the to, the, to the uniform density. But the measure is in the, now this is sort of you know, von Neumann entropy because we don't have a probabil probability distribution. We have PSD matrices, okay, which you can think of as, as quantum densities. Here's the definition of this thing. The only thing that's really important here is that the fact that all of the eigenvalues, you know, on the previous slide we said all of the eigenvalues of, uh, of, the, of not Q, but we call it B on the previous slide, are bounded by R. If you use that and you use the fact that dimension was R, okay, then it says that actually the, this relative entropy is bounded by log R. Okay, so this analytic control gives us, uh, yeah, gives us a bound on, the, on this relative entropy. And log R is very important here. I mean, if you had R, you, you can't even get started. Because okay, think back for a second. So we want to prove lower bounds when R is exponentially in N. Okay? And, and the degree, degree N is a trivial upper bound on the degree. So, Okay, so we want to prove, you know, so, so we need that log of R is, say, much less than N. Like, well, we need log of R to be something like, I mean, we need, we need, we would like this degree to be, say, at most square root of N, which means that we need to have a logarithmic dependence if we want to prove some exponential lower bound. Uh, okay. So, okay, so let's take this as a given, and then actually I'll, I'll come back and I can even tell you the, basically the proof of this theorem. Uh, let's take this as a given and finish the, the argument. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The classical equivalent would just be that the that the test functions are bounded in L infinity by by omega. And then the entropy is just the you, the classical entropy. Yeah. If you if you dequantumize every statement here, you'll get an equivalent uh, statement classically. But now the degree uh, of would here would become the the Hunter degree, the number of variables on which the functions depend. Uh, if we had more time, it would make more sense to, to first do the classical version and then this version. Uh, okay, so there's two things. First of all, what tests do we want to use here? So, okay, it makes a lot of sense. You know, we, we, we start with this hard function G, uh, and then we're trying to approximate, uh, sort of, you know, we're trying to approximate, say, Q by a low degree square. 
Uh, so what tests do you want to use? Well, sort of think about the tests. Okay, you can think about them. It's not so just uh, maybe this line is not so informative. But uh, you can think about tests that prove that the sum of squares degree of g is large. Then, you know, basically, okay, if you can approximate g by something, uh, and, and, that approximate, and, and the tests that prove that the sum of squares degree is large cannot distinguish those two things, uh, and one of them is low degree, then you arrive at a contradiction. Because you have something of high degree and something of low degree, and you have a test that proves one of them is high degree, but the test cannot distinguish the two. Okay, so you would get a contradiction. So what I'm saying is sort of, yeah, so we want to use the tests that prove the sum of squares degree of g is large. If our approximation, you know, basically, if our method of proving a lower bound on g cannot distinguish between g and our approximation for g, then we also prove a lower bound on our approximation. But our approximation, hopefully, is constructed to be low degree. So we should not be able to prove a lower bound on it. Okay, so those are low degree tests. That's good, because uh, it means that, okay, it's not clear why, but Intuitively, if you want to prove that something is degree d, you don't need degree d plus 100. You need degree at most d, but that's uh, okay. It's a bit. We don't have time to go into that. Those tests are low degree, okay? But there's a problem, uh, which maybe intuitively makes sense. Uh, you know, the you know the degree of those tests basically has to be at least the degree of 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 the lower bound you want to prove, which means that you know, no matter what the degree here is going to be larger than the lower bound that the, you know, that the test can prove. So like the point is that you, you, know, you cannot go around this circle and come back and hope to get some approximation where the degree is, is smaller than the sum of squares degree of g. You know, your, the degree here you will get is going to be always bigger than the sum of squares degree of g. And therefore, at, as, as stated, it doesn't work. You, the, you, know, you get something which is, uh, has non-trivially small degree, but not small enough that, that uh, uh, you know, but, but still degree much larger than the sum of squares degree of g, okay? which means that, okay, this doesn't quite work. So the, the last step is uh, this, uh, now is where the fact that we have this uh, subset comes into play. So remember, our, our goal was to say, okay, you have a factorization, approximate b of x by this low degree square, then you would, uh, you would get sort of a, an approximation for g as a low degree square, which should be impossible. We assume that g has high sum of squares degree. Um, but now, the approximation we get, although it has you know, small degree, it's not small enough. Okay? But the point is now that if we choose a random subset s, and then, we, and then we restrict r to the variables in s, then the claim is that this drastically, an expectation, reduces the degree of r. So you have to define carefully what this restriction means, but it, mean, it, it basically means that, I mean, one, one way to do this, I mean, right, r is a function on, uh, on, on n bits. Uh, so how can I restrict it to m bits? I could just give random values to the other n minus m bits. That's one thing. That doesn't work so well. Instead, what this means is that actually uh, you average over all possible assignments to the bits outside of s. And the claim is that this will tend to drastically reduce the degree of r. So much, so much so that uh, that now the lower bound you want to prove will work. We get a, we don't, we get a, on some subset s, we get a, a low degree sum of squares representation of g. And again, the point is that sort of like, uh, if we choose a random subset s, then when we uh, restrict to that subset, I mean, you can think about it. Basically, what happens is if you have a monomial in R, uh, the only way it survives is if all the variables lie in s. And if s is a small set, you know, think about s as being size square root of n. The probability that some large monomial manages to get all of its elements in the restriction is very small. So the degree drops, drops drastically. There is one caveat here. Here, again, we have to use the fact that the, you know, basically the, the correct distribution on sets is not the uniform one. It's coming from this A. Because, you know, I mean, it, a, if A was concentrating all of its attention on one set, then choosing a random one wouldn't have much, wouldn't really matter. So here, again, we need to use the fact that we have an analytic bound on A. The, the norm of, you know, the eigenvalues of A are bounded by R, which means that uh, sort of the distribution specified by A is not too far from the uniform distribution on sets. So then this, this, still, this still works. Okay. Uh, so uh, let me, yeah, we have only no minutes left. So let me skip for a second. I just have this one slide on how to prove that theorem. 
Yeah. Okay, but then I have one an, an open question slide. Okay, so I, so Ula has objected to skipping a slide, so I'll I'll say it. Okay, so uh, so so here's here's the sort of type of approximation we wanted to prove. We have a family of tests. We have our map Q. We wanted to approximate it by Q tilde with respect to the test, and we want for some you know somehow we want to say that Q tilde should be uh, simple, it shouldn't be too complicated a map, and so. Uh, Actually, what, you, what we do here is we find Q tilde by a, just by a convex program. But we minimize the, okay, again, you can think about Q tilde as a, as, a, as a big block diagonal matrix. So here I should say we minimize, this, this, these variables should be Q tilde. But basically, we take, the, we take, you know, this set of constraints, this actually gives you a, a, a spectrohedron. This is the intersection of a, poly, of a bunch of linear inequalities with the PSD cones. So you can optimize the convex function over this set. So what we do is we take the Q tilde that has the smallest uh, uh, quantum relative entropy, the you know, sort of the uniform density. Okay, so that's a minimizing a convex function over a convex set. If you think about what happens when you, you know, when you uh, minimize relative entropy or you maximize sort of Shannon entropy over a set, you know, the when you, you know, the, when you look at sort of the KKT optimality condition, the optimizer tends to it's the, it tends to be an exponential in the constraints. So okay, so here here these are these C lambdas are actually the dual variables corresponding to each of these constraints. You know, they're, uncon they're, they're unconstrained. I mean, they're can, they're just real numbers because we have a two-sided constraint. And uh, you know, optimality basically tells you that the Q star, the solution to this program, looks like this. Uh, so now, why is that thing a low degree square? Well. This is where the error comes into play. So uh, if the error is small, then just by duality, you can prove that you know, if, if the error, sorry, if the error is small. If, the error, if you allow error epsilon in the constraints, duality tells you that some of the, of the absolute values of the dual variables uh, is small, has, a, has an upper bound. Okay? So now we have uh, the, none of the coefficients are not too big. We know that each of these tests, if you think about the previous slide, has a bound on its maximum eigenvalue. So the whole uh, exponent here is not too big, uh, which means that we can take the, this is e to the x. We can now write out its Taylor series. And since the norm of the exponent is not too big, we can truncate the Taylor series at a convenient place. And this gives us a low degree representation. Okay. And if you want to square, I mean, it's, once you get here, it's, it's uh, easy. Just put one half here and then put square outside. Okay. So I mean, uh, the square part is not, is, not, uh, is not difficult. But the reason you get low degree is, is because of the because you allow some error in the constraints, it tells you that the, that the dual solution is is uh, not too complicated. This is part of a much larger philosophy that I now subscribe to. I'm happy to talk about offline. Okay, so now let me just say what are the some of the interesting future directions. The first thing is that everything I said only works uh, when your polytope has to contain all of zero one to the n. So it only works for constraint satisfaction problems. Uh, which means that, for instance, we don't know what happens. We don't know. We still don't know what happens for semi-definite programs uh, for the perfect matching polytope, or for things like finding cliques in GNP. These are all situations where your set of feasible points are now constrained. I mean, you cannot. You know, not all zero-one points are feasible. You know, only ones corresponding to cliques, only ones corresponding to tors, only ones corresponding to matchings. The proof breaks down rather spectacularly once you, you know, in all of these cases. And so far, nobody knows how to fix this. Uh, the other thing is that all the approximation lower bounds I mentioned, both for uh, for the STPs and also for for linear programs, they get stuck at size uh, n to the log n. Okay? And the reason for this is uh, if you go back to this slide I entitled "Quantum Learning," there is a you know there is some dependence on the on the maximum eigenvalue of the test. Uh, okay, so if you think about this in the context of multiplicative weights. The maximum eigenvalue of the test is exactly sort of the width of the corresponding oracle, and uh, the fact that we have such a bad dependence on the width is what gives n to the log n. This is kind of an interesting. I mean, this is you know, getting rid of the width, for instance, in linear programming or for all kinds of applications of multiplicative weights is a this is a big deal. Like it's a big area of study. So one can ask if you can use sort of width-independent methods to prove stronger lower bounds here. That would be uh, very very nice. And then let me mention sort of one question that comes from Rosborov, which uh, is meant to uh, demonstrate how 
uh, you know, how weak the techniques in the rest of the talk were. Uh, uh, which is now, instead of considering things that are low degree, what about things that are sparse? So suppose that Vs is the subset of all the polynomials that have at most S non-zero monomials. Okay. So now can you come up with a theory about sums of squares of sparse polynomials? Right. We have a good theory now, many people in the audience contribute to, about sums of squares of low degree polynomials. What about sums of squares of sparse polynomials? Okay. And the reason is that this sort of corresponds in proof complexity to a setting that which is, you know, which they don't understand very well. Sort of setting of dynamic proof systems. Um, here, the, I mean, here, like we, it really, I, you know, there's a paucity of techniques. So this is probably a next frontier of things to understand. Okay, let me stop there. You mean you mean the you mean the, you mean just the the, the hypercube zero one to the end yeah. like the, yeah so the I mean if you go back to the you know the the slide where I talked a bit about symmetry uh, yeah one one way to maybe to to say why this you cannot do this is because when you when you go to things like perfect matchings you still have a very large symmetry group but it's smaller than uh, the complete symmetric group on the coordinates and uh, this causes some like legitimate problems. Um, I mean, we, for instance, we, Thomas has the result, of course, that the, uh, like the perfect matching polytope doesn't have small uh, linear programs. But we also do not approve that in this framework. Um, that result sort of stands isolated by itself. I don't know if anybody still understands it so well. Sebastian, maybe you, uh, some and some others. But uh, it's, uh, yeah, so the, it's, uh, it's, it's tough. And it's not, by the way, it's not an issue of representation theory. Okay, so I, I spent quite a long time you know, learning representation theory and, and understanding what's going on there, there's really a, an analytic problem with this smaller symmetry group. I could talk about it with people offline, but it's more technical to describe. But you're right, this is, the, this is sort of the, the problem with going beyond unconstrained problems, that the symmetry group becomes too small. Basically, this restriction, which is, is, which is uh, uh, you know, exploiting the symmetry, it doesn't work very well uh, in these other settings. You can come up with natural notions of restriction, but when you look at the analytic properties, they're, they're very bad for these other problems. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, so let me, let me the, the answer is, is you know, sort of, I, I don't know the answer. I mean, I have to, we have to sit down and figure out the answer. If you think about dynamic proof systems that are allowed to, you know, like uh, sort of, uh, you know, basically the, uh, you give me a point and then I try to prove that that particular point is not in the polytope, okay? then you get something, you get something like this. Now where you get to depend on the point. So, and then the num somehow the number of rounds of this kind of cutting plane procedure corresponds to the sparsity. If I go further, I have no idea what I'm talking about. I, I can, we can talk about it offline. I can, I can figure it out, but I can figure it out, but. Uh, so you, you can only like, for example, know where the best polynomial scenario is, uh, the much, much faster than the best translation. Like if I'm allowed to try to have this much. What, you have a big, like, what do you mean, per perfect matching? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you would know. You guys are I the one. Know. You and Mohir are the ones who are. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, by the way, this is a, okay. Figuring out what's going on for perfect matchings and semi-definite programs is a great problem. Uh, perhaps a better problem is that when it's solved, I, I suspect it will be solved negatively, is, uh, is, is to come up with a, some notion of complexity for linear or semi-definite programs, it's able to distinguish between matching and PSP. That would be really nice. Um, 